So welcome uh, to the session on uh, verification of security. So this session is coordinated by uh, Ramanujam from IMSC, better known as JAM. So I will just hand it over to him and let him introduce the speakers and the team. Thanks very much. Uh, welcome to this uh, session. So I prefer to call it reasoning about security. And uh, there is, uh, we've already had an advertisement for the session during the previous talk. I thank for the thank Shiram and my friend there for the commercial. So, uh, so I want to add one more thing to this because it's not only about proofs and uh, you know automated proof specification, but also even checking out whether your requirements are even consistent. We are talking about doing something for 200 years, a whole lot of wish lists, many parties involved, many things. We want to even make sure that there are no conflicts, not just challenges, right? So we want to show that it's even possible. What is impossible? What's possible? So there is some reasoning involved, and uh, we have some discussion on this session. Um, so we have three brilliant speakers. Start with Sanjeeva Prasad from uh, IIT Delhi. Then we have Asim Rastogi from Microsoft Research. And then we have Suresh from Chennai Mathematical Institute, who will be outlining the this uh, reasoning about this. So we start with Sanjeeva and language basic. Thanks. Thanks. Good. Yeah, I, it was very nice to get switched on with like the Energizer bunny in pressed out there. Uh, thanks, uh, Jam and uh, Madhavan and all of you for asking me to uh, come and talk. And, ra and rather than talk about something which uh, we've been doing, I thought uh, it's worthwhile just going through some of the background work over the last 30 years that various people have done because uh, this aspect of security is slightly less known than uh, both cryptography and systems level uh, security. So this is an overview about what is language-based security, and that'll be the, uh, the larger part of the talk. And then I'll probably go back and just tell you some of the little bits of mathematics that uh, came into play uh, way back, and we are already talking of something like 45 years ago, and uh, how, uh, you know, uh, ideas from the 1980s were, are still used. And that uh, some recent work, which if I get to it, that I've been doing with a student of mine who's uh, just submitted a thesis. On, and there's still some work you can do going back to the fundamentals. And there's still some uh, little mathematics you can introduce. Very simple mathematics. I always believe simple is better. Right. So this is just an outline. And I'll come back to this uh, as a marker of where we are in the talk. So some very quick background, uh, bugs and insecurity, and this is what attackers exploit all the time. They're there in system software, uh, your uh, memory access violations, your stack overflows, uh, access control violations. They're programming errors, which, and uh, they're implementation errors. And uh, sort of uh, paradigmatic here, uh, the buffer overflow and stack smashing attacks, but there are many others uh, which are just due to compiler bugs and so on. Uh, there's particularly interesting and uh, is illegal information flow, uh, which is very uh, application specific, and that's what I want to come back to sometime later in the uh, in the talk. Right. So, very roughly, what does a system provide you? Well, it, operating systems give you some kind of security, but it's very very coarse grained, uh, and the trusted code base there is basically the kernel, and the principles, the security principles, are basically at the users level. The user IDs are uh, essentially the principles. And there are various mechanisms to enforce security at that level. Uh, what is problematic with looking at security just at this level? Well, first of all, the trusted code base is large and complex. It's the entire OS, and that's very hard to reason about. Uh, the second thing is that the policies which you can define are pretty much given to you. And what you uh, and you're very limited by the mechanism. You don't have a vocabulary to talk about more interesting resources and more interesting policies. So that's basically the motivation to go forward uh, to the idea of language-based security. Uh, I apologize for these rather boring slides. I mean, I didn't get a lot of time to think about it and reorganize this. But this is basically what language-based security is. Um, it's basically the idea of providing fine-grained, finer-grained uh, security at the application level and at a high level. 
and uh, the, our primary vehicle there are techniques we use from programming languages. And Asim, will, who will follow me, will give you a very concrete demonstration of this. Uh, so we use various ideas from programming languages. One of them is program rewriting, uh, and in particular, instrumenting code, something which we do quite normally when we debug things and look at uh, stuff that way. Using linguistic features, you know, the modules and abstractions, so that we can sort of reason about programs in a sort of compositional way. Um, type systems, and this is something which I'll uh, dwell a little longer uh, later in the talk. And in fact, more generally, uh, various static analyses uh, that are done based on uh, programming language based ideas, semantics. Uh, and then in particular, there's a very exciting uh, line of work which began about 20 years ago, which had to do with certified uh, compilation and a, another pl uh, a slight variant of that which is called translation validation. So I mentioned certified compilation a little bit. And then finally, the ideas from model checking, which Sriram here is probably very, is, is the in-house expert here, but there are others as well who do work on this. So this is basically part of the toolkit that uh, we come to in language-based uh, security. And there are just two really important principles which are being used here. First of all, a, you want to have much more interesting notions of principles, but we give privileges to these principles, and you don't want to give any principle more privilege than is necessary for performing what they're supposed to do. And um, because we are at the language level, we've got much more flexible notions of what a principle is. It could be the program counter, it could be the history, it could be the programmer who wrote the code, it could be the owner of the code. You have a lot to play with, it's very application specific. And then you can have different notions of what privileges are. One is ownership, uh, the notions of capabilities, uh, delegation, the ability to delegate capabilities, the ability to act for somebody, to be an authority. These are various things that you can sort of now describe because you are at a linguistic level. You have the, uh, the, the mechanisms for doing so. And the other principle which has always guided all security is Keep your trusted code base as minimal as possible so that you can reason about it. Keep the mechanisms st uh, as easy to describe and as small. And this is something which will keep coming back. It's like an Occam's razor at work. Both of these are somewhat like Occam's razors, you know, well, safety, safety blade versions of Occam's razor. So the oldest way of talk of using um, the idea of um, checking the security of a program is just put in a, an execution monitor, a reference monitor. And this is an idea which actually even comes from operating systems and debugging in general. And um, one thing which you do is to just take your program and rewrite it by inserting little bits of code which are monitoring for various violations of properties. And what kinds of properties can you easily monitor? Well, they're, technically they're called safety properties. And a safety property is basically a set of runs. And uh, those runs are in there by virtue of being there. They don't depend on anything else. And the second thing is that uh, a safety property is a prefix closed set. And in fact, if you have a violation of a safety property, it always happens in a finite <coughs> prefix of a run. So that's basically what uh, you uh, can very nicely monitor for. But of course, when you insert code in there, you're, go you're going to slow down the code. Performance is going to take a hit. Uh, what can you do then? You can just take some static analysis techniques and start saying, hey, I don't need to insert the code at these places because uh, things can be, will still work right if I remove this inlining at various places. Um, but here is the unfortunate thing which happens. The trusted code base now has to include that code optimizer. So you've sort of pushed in not only the compiler, but also all the optimization phases of the compiler out there. And there are a couple of things you need to do when you do this sort of thing. And uh, from the semantics viewpoint, you've got to just make sure that this instrumentation does not go and change the semantics. Uh, would be wonderful if you had zero overhead, you know, no performance hit, uh, and you sort of are monitoring code, 
And typically, a lot of work has gone uh, in over the last 20 years of, of having hardware monitors or, or custom-built ASICs which run together with the code. Uh, they're, they're placed alongside the code, and they're monitoring the execution for a violation. And um, that's a little less flexible. You can't sort of at compile time decide what monitor to do, to, to put in there, because you're building a chip entirely for that. We've been doing some very uh, simple work of taking this idea and using some real estate which is on chip to do an almost zero overhead monitoring where the monitor is uh, synthesized at compile time, very application specific. And we use that design for debug space, which is real estate that is wasted on the chip after it's been fabricated to, mo to sort of moderate this interaction between uh, the, the code which is running on the CPU and the monitor which is sitting in an FPGA on chip. It's almost at line speed. Uh, a slight slowdown is all that we see. And uh, this is work that some colleagues, uh, a colleague of mine and a couple of students did in, and it appeared in um, DAC last, last year in, January, in 2019. So there's a lot of work happening. I uh, just was doing a little plug for myself. But uh, this is where uh, one line of work is going. Uh, but unfortunately, these, this kind of monitoring is not adequate. It's, uh, you can't monitor and, and, and sh you know, show your programs or your application is free of security problems just by monitoring runtime things. So that's the very last thing you should do. Uh, you can't monitor for availability. You can't monitor for liveness. Uh, and you can't monitor for a very large class of security properties, which are actually hyper properties. Properties not of one run, but of multiple runs. And uh, monitoring also involves shoving uh, this huge burden of dynamic checks into the execution time. Uh, so what do you do instead? Well, if you had the entire um, program, you can actually start reasoning about more than one run at a time. You can just do this analysis. And this is familiar territory for all people who work in programming languages, which is, um, well, see if, uh, if you define a set of rules uh, which are very sort of program structure specific in terms of variables, expressions, statements, functions, and so on, and check for various features such as memory safety or control safety check that your abstract types are uh, you know, correctly uh, used, and so on. And now you've moved the onus from the person who runs the program to the person who, uh, the programmer. They have to comply with these type checking rules. And you've got the whole compiler now. Right? And so you'll only have, the in the runtime, those very last things like you know, array bounds, checks, and so on, which you may not be able to check at compile time. So this is the large body of work that uh, happens, the security-related work in the entire Programming Languages Committee. The Popple and PLDI uh, committee would, uh, groups of people would, community would look at that. But what is the uh, trade-off here? Well, first of all, all of this tends to happen at a high-level language where you do know what the operational behavior of programs will be. And now you've put the entire onus on the compiler writer and uh, they need to soundly implement your type system and your language. Uh, there are a whole gamut of type systems that are out there for various properties, particularly information flow. Uh, very interesting sets of properties that you can actually just do compile time analysis, type analysis um, for confidentiality or integrity. And these are two dual properties to each other. And um, the trend has been to use more and more interesting type systems, particularly dependent types. And uh, there's some work which we have been looking at out there. Uh, but what's the sort of uh, unfortunate thing here is that the entire compiler is now in your trusted code base. And the question is, what about object code? What guarantees can I give about that? Uh, so there's this exciting piece of work called certified compilation, which sort of rips that uh, problem into two different things, which is that the compiler generates object code, but uh, rather than the compiler sitting in the trusted code base, it sits outside the trusted code base and provides a certificate 
which the consumer of the code just has to verify that this certificate is a good certificate. And so now you've actually made this problem of, instead of having a trusted compiler, you now have an untrusted certifying compiler, but a trusted <coughs> certificate checker. And what's the benefit? The, the, the checker tends to be small. Um, it, it takes away uh, the burden uh, from the code consumer. And you have very nice concrete instances of this uh, uh, using typed assembly language for uh, real machines rather than just abstract machines. And in particular, there's this extreme version of uh, this uh, certified compilation, which is called proof carrying code. And uh, it's not limited to traditional type safety. And your type checker now has, is in a very expressive uh, meta logic. And now you can start, why use an expressive meta logic? Well, uh, you can keep the trusted code base very small. And it's easy to add uh, application specific or, or property specific axioms into the, uh, into the logic. So that's broadly a survey of what's happening. And there are combinations of these various aspects. There's also model checking, which I haven't touched. But there are various things that happen in this space. So now let me just go back to 1976 and uh, Dorothy Denning. And what is the basis? So I'm sort of talking about the basis for all the static analysis. Um, so uh, in 1976, there were various analyses that were happening for different pieces of code. There, were, there was nothing really uh, uh, sort of unifying them. And Dorothy Denning uh, came along and said, well, there's a, this whole business about secure information flow. So let me just motivate what is secure information flow. It is um, different from the mechanisms we already have, which is access control is a way of controlling access to data which is at rest. And encryption is a way of sort of protecting data while it's in motion when it's when I give you data and want to make sure that nobody else goes and corrupts it or, or sees what it is and so on. Uh, so they restrict the release of information, but they ha they, it's not a mechanism of propagate, propagating how you're going to maintain security of the information. And so that's um, where information flow control comes in. And that's basically saying that there's no unauthorized flow of information, right? Uh, and that uh, is what happens if information flow is not controlled. Um, OK, so what did Dorothy Denning uh, uh, really come up with? She said, well, lattices are a very, very good model for, um, for talking about information flow, uh, what is permitted and what's not. So uh, she said, well, let's c talk about some logical storage objects. Let's call them n. And then there are these processes or principles, which are the active agents. And um, then there are these security classes. And back then, uh, the military standard had four. But uh, the simplest one is uh, uh, there are just two security classes. There's public and there's secret. And um, there is a class combining operator, which says that, well, what do I do if I've got some information which is public and some which is secret, and I'm combining them? What happens to the? Uh, what security class do these go into? Well, you take the least upper bound in the lattice sense. That's what she was proposing. And then there's a relationship which says, what is the less than equal to in the lattice, which is exactly trying to characterize what are the permitted flows. You can always move public information to uh, secret, uh, but you can't move things the other way. All right? so, um, so the kind of policies that were there in Bell and La Padula uh, talked about, you know, uh, read, up, uh, read up, write down, and so on. But actually, it's refined to be a little better that you can only write information upwards, and you can only read from things which are below you in this lattice. So, for example, um, this has got to do with how uh, you would do the uh, the type checker would say, suppose you have three three uh, objects A, B, and C. Uh, sorry, there are four, A, B, C, and D. Uh, and A was public, and C and D were public, and B was secret. Uh, you, this is a legitimate uh, assignment. If you took the contents of A and put them into B, it's OK. Uh, on the other hand, if you try to put the contents of B into C, because C is public, this means you're leaking information. And the type system is sort of geared. The analysis is geared to detect and flag that this is something wrong. 
And this is how um, uh, another one where if you try to combine public and uh, secret information, try to put it into pu the public domain, that's also not OK. So, and that's where the lab operation comes into play. So um, basically, we're saying that information can flow this way, but it can't flow that way. And uh, that's to do with confidentiality. But a completely dual treatment is integrity. And so you have stuff which is information which is trusted, uh, sorry, trusted and untrusted. And you can always move trusted information into an object which is untrusted, but you shouldn't do uh, things in the other direction. Right? So this is basically what she proposed as the right <coughs> mathematics underlying all static analysis having to do with uh, secure information flow. Um, and here is an example of people would just come up with the lattice. And so this is for an educational institution. Public information, totally secret information, stuff that's accessible to students, and you know, stuff that's accessible to faculty members, and so on. And you could come up with some lattice of this kind, any lattice. right? Uh, and that's basically where organizations can come and start defining their policies and what is um, permissible flows in that policy. So here was the example of what, uh, you know, you took a language and you started giving a type system. And this is sort of very roughly what uh, the, the typing rules, I've sort of put them into plain English of what's going on for each of these uh, rules. And this is a sort of an approximation. It doesn't say exactly uh, those secure programs are going to be accepted. Uh, it says, well, I'll uh, uh, make sure that anything which passes these these typing rules are, are going to be secure. But some possible secure programs might also be rejected. Right? So uh, here's a, a, a thing which is often not uh, um, uh, sort of, um, there frequently, which is there are explicit flows when I assign, for example, assign uh, a value to uh, a variable. That's a very explicit flow. Then on the previous slide, those were explicit flows. But here, there's one which is an implicit flow. So if A is supposed to be a, a, a secret, and B is a public uh, object, and if I did this uh, conditional statement, uh, even though I'm not actually s setting the value of, uh, uh, of A into B, I'm implicitly uh, getting that information flow happen. And so the type system had to take into account implicit flows as well. And there's a very simple trick to make uh, implicit flows explicit, which is to always take this additional um, uh, object or variable, namely the program counter, and start saying, oh, the program counter's security level is also going to be sort of joined into uh, the security level of whatever you're working with. Okay, so these are the techniques which are which uh, the Denning thing. Uh, uh, school uh, followed, and then there have been 40 years of program analysis uh, using for, for secure information flow with lots of variants and lots of very uh, nice things. But one very nice thing which happened, and one unfortunate thing as well that happened with this analysis is that it became entirely syntactic. It became a syntactic game, and there was no relationship to semantics. And it took a while. To, for people to recognize that, look, there, you know, you also have to tie it back to the semantics, the operational behavior of programs. And there was a, uh, an old uh, pro proposal of an idea called non-interference uh, by Gogan and Messager in 1982, which very roughly says that, look, you know, you you pick a level that the context of the adversary has, and now let me see objects which are above that level. Are the, uh, are the ones which the adversary should not have access to. Objects below that security level, the adversary can actually read. And what you want to see is that no information leaks from those which are at a higher security level to any object in the lower security level. And the way it's done is to take, uh, you take the same program, and you take two memory states which are the same in all the low security variables, uh, but may differ in the, high, in the values held in the high security uh, variables. You run the program, and you see at the end of the day whether you can possibly get different values in the lower part of it. And if you could get different values, then there's a security leakage. 
So the analysis is just trying to do this, uh, to, to find out if there's any kind of leakage. Right? Um, so, right. so, so what um, a bunch of people did, and this is the paper, I, you know, when I read this paper, I said, well, I had all the ingredients to actually write this in, by 1996, I, um, and I wish I had written this paper. This is one of those papers you wish you had written which basically tied in the Dennings model of, of the static analysis with the non-interference as the correct notion of, um, of the semantics. And basically, they said, well, if you go and pick that, what you're going to make sure is that all reads are only up here. They're always strictly from below. All writes are, and so there's a simple security lemma they prove. Uh, all writes are strictly above. Um, and so that's a confinement lemma. And they prove a, a type soundness result. Say that if you, your type system says that this program is secure, then you will not see interference. It'll be non-interfering. So this is basically the important semantic theorem which tied up the two um, approaches, and, or, or, or rather gave back semantics into the, the syntactic game. Um, so from there, what we've been doing in the last uh, few years with the student is that we started asking that, suppose you have two organizations which independently came up with their policies, and they need to exchange information. So this is a sort of decomposition way of looking at things. Can I build secure exchange between them? And what's the right mathematics? So clearly, they've got their lattices. They've shown things to work. But then what, how should I, what is the memorandum of understanding between this organization and that organization which says data from here can go there and data from there can go into this class here? So we started looking at that and um, to our consternation, this very simple problem hadn't been solved. Um, and various simple ideas just don't work, like setting up uh, uh, just a one-one function doesn't work because you can get leakages. Um, monotonicity is something which is fine in one direction, but the moment you get bidirectional flow, monotonicity breaks down. You still can have leakages. And so these diagrams I can make available, and this is in a this is published work, so it's it's there. And so you could see that these are also bad ideas. So we said, well, it should be sort of an inflationary uh, way of going upwards in the lattice whenever you move information from here to there and then back. You shouldn't be going to some unrelated thing. You should strictly be going up in the lattice. Um, so that's the first condition. And this is to be contrasted with the Galois connection. Whenever you have two monotone functions and between two uh, lattices, you always think Galois connections. It turned out that was the wrong thing, and we had been looking at it for too many uh, months uh, looking at the wrong framework. Turns out Galois connections are absolutely the wrong thing to do, but they're pretty closely related to something which uh, we found works, and that's something which has been playfully called the Lagua connection. So it's very roughly like a Galois connection. It's uh, two monotone functions, both going upwards, but both are expansive. And this very nicely generalizes all uses of Galois connections, because in fact, in static analysis, you only use Galois insertions. And in Galois insertions, in one direction, you have to be surjective. And this frees you from that restriction. So it's terrifically exciting that it's not just in security, but I think we can redo a lot of static analysis using this very nice framework. And using this nice framework, we could prove a bunch of things. And we could just go through the uh, Volpano-Smith, um, I'm going to just skip over this, ah. things, give type systems, give uh, operational semantics, and generalize the Volpano-Smith thing to multiple domains, uh, and prove the main theorem out there. And it all works, and it's extremely simple, and that's where uh, we're very excited. We've d done a bunch of refinements on uh, types uh, on the security type systems, and so we can actually do very purpose limited uh, flows, which are allowed, which were the de dependent type systems were meant to do, but unfortunately they haven't got their semantics right. And I think we've 
uh, it's not yet work published, but I think that we've, we've figured out how best to do this in a minimal way. Uh, so that's how much I want to talk uh, about our current work, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you, running short um, morning, everyone. My name is Asim Rastogi. I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research Bangalore. So uh, I work in the areas of programming languages and program verification. Uh, more specifically, I work on this language called S star. It's a language for uh, program verification. We'll see more details of what S star looks like uh, later in the talk. Um, you might have seen me given some S star talk or tutorial at some other point. And uh, since this is a security themed summit, I thought I'll give a security oriented talk on S star. So, uh, so what I'm going to do is probably show you why is it really hard to write correct and secure software today? What kind of attack surfaces these software have and what kind of techniques do attackers use to really get into these programs. And then tell you about how program verification helps, helps us secure uh, this kind of software. So I'll first probably scare you and then I'll tell you that it's not so bad. So we are in the safe hands. So um, uh, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, please just raise your hand, interrupt me anytime you don't understand anything. Okay, so the way I'm going to show you uh, the first part of the talk is to take some examples of security critical code and then show you what kind of vulnerabilities uh, they have that att attackers can exploit. So my first example is a cryptographic message authentication code. It's a, uh, it's a, cryptographic, it's a class of cryptographic algorithms that uh, help establish in integrity and authenticity of messages. So poly1305, which is the current example, is a new, is one of the latest uh, cryptographic Mac. It's a, it's recommended Mac for TLS 1.3 standard, so it's pretty uh, important. Uh, underlying poly1305 is a mathematical field of prime numbers 2 to the power 130 minus 5. So all the operations that happen in the cryptographic Mac are some field operations in this uh, prime field. So when, you, when developers actually implement it, they have to pick a representation of how to represent these field elements on 32 and 64 bit ar architectures, right? They have to, like these are big numbers, register size is 32 or 64 bits, so you have to really pick how, what representation do you want to use. And you might think the natural representation, for example, 32 bits is uh, you take five registers, pack four of them perfectly, and then use the two bits from the rest of it, and then similarly some representation for 64 bits. But as it turns out, this is not optimal. So what developers actually do is they use for the 32-bit, for example, they use five registers, but 26 bits, bits each, and use rest of the bits for delayed propagation of the carries. So anytime, for example, you do some operation, you don't have to really put the carry back, in, back into the result. You can delay it till some point, and this gives you more optimal performance. And since this crypto code is very performance sensitive because um, it's like you're doing it for all the messages that are going out, the de developers really care about this level of performance. And now, as you would expect, this is tricky to get right, and it's not really surprising that even in the open source and most widely used implementations of Poly1305, there are these kinds of bugs that keep popping up. The bugs range anywhere from incorrect output to heap buffer overflows, and these kind of bugs like, keep coming up. So you can imagine if, uh, the, uh, if the implementation computes incorrect output, then an attacker can forge a Mac and convince you that uh, this message was sent by somebody else. OK? Um, the second example is I'm going to take is trusted platform modules. So these are modules that help you attest uh, hardware or software running on a device. For example, imagine you're offloading some computation to the cloud, and you want to know that the hardware or the, and the software that's running on the cloud server is actually what you want it to be. And trusted platform modules help you establish that trust on the cloud server. So uh, these used to be hardware implemented, but now because of IOTs uh, and low cost, and derived by the low cost, they are now mostly software-based solutions. And they're also used in IOT devices. So imagine there's an IOT device that's sending you some data. You want to make sure that the data is actually coming from the device, running a software that does not have a backdoor, that's not malicious, and you want to attest to all those properties of the device itself. So this is, again, fairly security critical piece of code. Um, it's also very simple functionality. Like the code, I think it's 
is computing some measurements, which is cryptographic hashes, and issuing certificate about the code and hardware, about the software and hardware that it's running. So you would think that this should be easy to get right, and but it's not the case. For example, very recently, uh, researchers found uh, vulnerabilities and they could hack into um, both Intel and ST microelectronics micro implementations of these TPMs, and the vulnerability that they exploited was not really uh, an implementation or, I mean, it is an implementation vulnerability, but it's not a direct attack. What they did is they ran the soft, they ran the TPM module multiple times, and by observing how much time, how much time it was taking, they were able to deduce the keys. So if your operation depends on the secret key, if, if, the, if, you, if the time that an operation takes depends on the secret keys, that's called a timing channel attack. And using that, researchers were able to actually infer the private keys of the TPM devices. And as you can imagine, this kind of leakage is really hard to safeguard against. I mean, you have to be really careful in programming that you're not, the time that your code takes to run does not depend on the secrets that you're trying to protect. Okay, the third example that I'll take is that of uh, blockchains and smart contracts. So smart contracts are these small programs that govern transactions and legal agreements between parties on the blockchain. Um, these are typically really small programs, like since this is just, I mean, it's not too complicated, maybe hundreds, maximum thousand lines of code. So once again, you would think that maybe we'll be able to get this one right, but again, that's not the case. Some of you might have heard of this uh, DAO attack that happened on the Ethereum blockchain, which is uh, second most famous blockchain after Bitcoin. And so this DAO contract was a trust fund contract where uh, the idea of the contract was that people are going to put money in it, and after some 28 days or so, they are going to vote on how this money should be spent. But what happened is before they could actually reach that stage, an attacker exploited a vulnerability in the contract and they were able to siphon off $50 million worth of uh, blockchain currency. And to pro I mean, it was a big thing, so to protect against that, they had to hard fork the blockchain back to some previous version, which is kind of goes back, which is goes against the whole philosophy of the blockchain. So, uh, so this is again an example where these are small programs, but the underlying semantics of the blockchain is complicated, so it's tricky and hard to get these programs right. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so actually what happens is, the function, the contract has a, so this is just a snippet, the contract had a deposit function and it also had a withdraw function. So when it withdrew, when you withdraw, it says that, okay, the sender balance is greater than or equal to amount or not. If it is, it first transferred the balance and then decreased the uh, balance in its own record. But according, like, this is some weird blockchain semantics, the attacker could call into the withdraw again and then it could just siphon off the money. It, it's a re-entrancy attack, yes. Okay, so to summarize, um, if you have a security critical software, then attackers are really motivated to break into it, and the attack surface is really big. You could have functional correctness bugs that could be exploited. You could have low-level implementation bugs, like buffer overflows, um, null pointer dereferences, like you name it, right, stack overflows. Indirect leakages of sensitive data, so timing channel attack, we looked at an example. There could be other, there are other examples of these attacks, like power, um, memory access patterns, and complicated semantics. Sometimes the underlying platform is not your traditional CPU architecture, so the underlying semantics could be complicated and attackers could really exploit uh, misunderstanding of those semantics. So how does program verification help? And first I'll tell you about what program verification is, a brief history of program verification, and then uh, relate my own research in program verification uh, by giving examples of how we are trying to solve these problems. So, pro so the idea of program verification is to mathematically prove that your programs meet certain logical specifications, okay? So what you do is you write your programs in a tool called Program Verifier, but in addition to writing your programs, you also write some logical specifications. And you encode the properties that you want your programs to satisfy into those specifications. Once you have done that, you work with the program verifier to mathematically prove that your programs actually meet those specifications. 
and that's and since it's like uh, mathematical foundation, so you're actually proving that no matter what the input to the program is, your program will always behave according to these. And once you have done that, you could extract the program to some executable language, like OCaml, C, or something, and then compile and run it from there. Okay? So in a way, like, as opposed to testing, where you are only seeing that my program works correct on certain inputs, program verification allows you to ap prove absence of bugs for all inputs rather than only certain subset of inputs. That's what testing uh, gives you. So it's much, much stronger property than what testing provides. Okay, so uh, some history, program verification is not something new. It has been around since 1970s. So this is the first paper that uh, Tony Hoare wrote on uh, an axiomatic semantics for an imperative language to say how we can prove properties about an imperative language. But it did not make much progress until the late 90s. And this is a quote from Tony Hoare which is actually very interesting. And to summarize the quote, it's actually saying that uh, program verification still remains a daunting task and probably it's not worth it because right now the world is not facing the kind of problems that program verification solves. But what happened in the late 90s, well, internet came up, machines got connected to each other, and they got, like, secure software got exposed to just the world, and then attackers could hack into it. It was not ready. And so the community again caught up, and we have made tremendous progress in this area in the last two decades, both in terms of tools that we have built to uh, formally verify the programs, like Star, Coq, Isabel, all these are program verifiers. Z3 is an SMT solver, and SMT solvers are uh, integral part of some verifiers. And both, and also in terms of the verified artifacts that we have produced of uh, critical software. So for example, ComCert is a verified C compiler. So uh, uh, the code comes with a formal proof that the assembly code that it emits has the same semantics of the input C code. Uh, SEL4 is a verified Linux implementation. And Hacklestar is a verified cryptographic library written, in a, written and verified in a star, which I'll talk about uh, later. OK, so now where does a star come in? So a star, remember there was a program verifier box here. So a star is a program verifier. Uh, you write your program and specifications in a star. And then you work with a star to carry out your proofs. Uh, a star provides you semi-automation because it uses a Z3 SMT solver in the back end, so you don't have to do all the proofs yourself. Sometimes you get lucky and uh, the SMT solver is able to find the proofs for you. Uh, it's open source on GitHub. I uh, encourage you to go and have a look. Um, a star programs compile to OCaml. So all S star programs compile to OCaml, and a subset of S star programs can also compile to C. And then you can use the OCaml and C compilers to run the programs. So what I would, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I made these slides very recently, so I forgot what's coming next. Uh, so I'm going to give you an example of uh, a code verified in a star. So let's look at what code and spec in a star look like. So this is, for example, a merge sort. Uh, it's a very fairly standard implementation of merge sort, recursive implementation. You first partition the list. You recursively merge sort the two lists, and then you merge them using some merge uh, routine. So I'm not showing you partition and merge, but you can imagine what the implementation looks like. It's a functional, like traditional functional program, right? So now suppose I want to prove correctness of this algorithm. So to do that, I first have to define what sorted list means. So we can do that also in a star. So I can write a function called sorted, which says that empty list is sorted, singleton list is always sorted, and x, y followed by tail is sorted if x is less than or equal to y, and y followed by tail is sorted. Right? This is a standard notion of what sortedness means. But this is not the only property that I want of a sort algorithm. I mean, if this was the only property, that an, then an algorithm that just returns an empty list all the time is also returning sorted list. So the second property that we care about is that the output list should be a permutation of the input list. So we can also define what a permutation means. So L and M are permutations of each other. If for all elements, count of uh, for all x, count of x in L is same as count of x in M. And now we can write a spec for this merge sort, saying that it takes a list of integers as input, it returns a list of integers as output, such that the output list is sorted, and it's a permutation of the input list. 
And now once you've written the specification, you can work in a star to actually prove this. Uh, sometimes the proof may go, it's, I mean, depending on the program, sometimes it may be fully automatic, sometimes you may have to provide hints, and, but once you prove this, you know that your implementation uh, provably satisfies this spec. <coughs> Your uh, sorted is a particular program version of a specification. And your permutation is a program version of a property of the definition of permutation, which s works for you, right? I mean, it works in this example. Because you're just counting the x. That's usually not the definition of permutation. Right? Usually, you'll talk in terms of some kind of function or bijection on positions okay. and so on. Uh, although this is a this is an abstraction of that which works beautifully. Okay. Right? Uh, so how do we know that we've got the right, for example, permutation, for example, that we've got a nice property of right. permutations that I can actually use for the verification. Of right. Yeah, I think that's a that's a problem which is outside the tool itself. Right. You have to think about what specification you want to prove. And as you, you're right, there are multiple ways to express the same things. Uh, some of them are more amenable to verification. Some of them are less. And it's just by practice that you know what's going to work and what not. Yeah, but it's, it's basically a design question. It's like outside the tool, really. So uh, in this program, for example, you know, what you are verifying is because you expect that uh, output is you know, verifying certain thing. Like uh -huh. But for example, if you write, if you have a program which is, for example, as simple as, for example, simulating a DFA, uh -huh. there it's like you you are writing a program to solve a decisional problem. Your answer at the end is one or zero. So, will this verifier can handle that? So you're saying, uh, like, I, I write a program for DFA simulation. Okay. So the program, if the program is good, it's it's going to sort I of see, accept I the see. language, you know. So you're saying sometimes the program may itself be its spec own specification, right? Uh, is, is that the question? Is no, no. The DFA, if I sim simulate, uh -huh. it, it it realizes certain language. Correct. So the inputs are strings, and it accepts or rejects. Okay. But then I have to verify that uh, I sub I have written a DFA which is supposed to, you know, sort okay, of accept okay, a okay. certain language. How do I verify that? So you could, I mean. Um, so for example, one way to do that could be uh, you write a separate verifier that runs the DFA and outputs 0 or 1. And maybe you have a more optimized routine to say that, OK, whether this string belongs to a certain class of language. And you may want to verify that my more optimized routine is actually implementing the DFA right. Uh, if, you are, if your implementation of uh, verifying this string belongs to the language is just run the DFA, then there's no difference between the spec and the program itself. But sometimes you may want to do more optimized things, like this crypto example that I gave, right? The specification is very simple. It's like maybe an addition of two 130-bit uh, prime numbers. But the implementation is actually quite funky. It's going to do delayed carry propagation and whatnot. And in those cases, I can actually prove that no matter what tricks did I play in the optimization phase, it meets the specification, which is simple and clean. So in your case, it might help if, for example, my implementation is very tricky, but the specification is just that, OK, go run the DFA in the most primitive way you can, and then you prove that the implementation meets the specification. Does that answer the question? OK. OK, yeah, fine with me. OK, so, uh, so this is just a small example. I'm now going to tell you. Uh, what actual real world interesting things we have done with that star. So um, with collaborators at other institutions, we have built this verified cryptographic library called HackleStar. Uh, it's a, a collection of cryptographic algorithms that have been formally verified in a star. And the properties that, and this is already shipping in Firefox. So since I think November 2017, uh, if you use Firefox today, probably you are running one of, uh, and you use HTTPS, for example, you are running a star verified code. And it's also recently has become part of the Linux kernel. So the properties that we have verified are memory and type safety. So your program, it, your algorithms do not have um, buffer overflows or null pointer dereferences. So we verify that those kind of properties. We verify functional correctness. For example, in poly, so this is a, 
Uh, you don't have to read this, but this is a poly 1305 spec that we prove of the Mac. And eventually, this spec is going to say that uh, whatever is computed, the final tag is actually what the specification is. And the specification is just like in terms of mathematical integers that are 130 bit long, so it's very uh, nice and clean and not into this uh, bit manipulations. And we also prove side channel resistance with the asterisk saying that for certain types of side channels. Uh, so it, it means that, um, so there's a model of side channel resistance called program counter model, which says that your program timing and memory access patterns do not depend on secrets. And our library, we prove that uh, it follow it belongs to that program counter model and the secrets are not leaked via these two kinds of side channels. Okay, for verified TPMs, with Kapil here, we are working on uh, verifying these TPM firmware, which is actually this uh, software code that does attestation. And there again, we are trying to prove, so it's ongoing project, we are trying to prove similar kind of properties, memory and type safety, functional correctness, and side channel resistance, which will actually prevent the kind of attack that I showed you, the timing-based attack. So we actually prove, we are trying to prove that our code does not uh, leak uh, secrets based on timing and memory access patterns. And we may also actually prove cryptographic security, but this is really to be done. Uh, for smart contracts, there's another project that I'm doing with other colleagues in the lab, which is uh, we are building a language and a framework for verifying smart contracts. And since smart contracts come with uh, a non-traditional semantics, like the semantics is what the blockchain implements, it's the project actually contains some language design component also. So we have a new language for writing smart contracts. It's called Celestial. Um, and by language design, we actually rule out certain classes of bugs. So these kind of uh, re-entrancy bug that I showed you is just ruled out by the language design itself. And we verify properties such as functional correctness so that like you could actually verify that the attacker cannot siphon off money like they did in DAO. But we also are trying to look at fairness properties wherein if some contract says that, hey, solve this puzzle for me, then I'll give you some money, then, actually, then the contract actually gives you money. It does not like, start crashing once it sees the solution. Um, OK, so this is the last slide of what I have. So wrapping up, hopefully I told you uh, how program verification can be used to uh, secure critical software that exists today. Um, I just leave you with two thoughts out here. Uh, one is that the community has really worked on producing uh, verified software artifacts. So I think we should consider using them wherever we can. For example, this verified crypto library, if you're writing a crypto application, then you should consider using verified implementations. And the other is, uh, can we leverage recent advances in formal verification to, to identify and verify like what's the next security critical software that we should verify? And I think tools are today at a stage where experts like people in this room can really have a go at it. And some examples could be uh, maybe Enclave firmware, right? Enclave firmware and software. Can we verify all the code? So Enclaves are small, so the code that runs inside is not really that big. Can we formally verify that code? The firmware that runs inside the Enclave, which does attestation and uh, I don't know what not, can we verify that code? Can we verify cryptographic file systems, the file systems that are crucial for maintaining integrity of the files? And um, yeah, I think that's what I leave you with. This is again the FSTAR link, and I'm always happy to uh, hear about or help if you want to use FSTAR for your project, so uh, please consider using it. Thank you. Thank you, Asim. And uh, now we have Suresh from Chennai Mathematical Institute. Very famous paper called Programming Satan's Computer. Now we're talking about verifying Satan's Computer. Hi, I'm Suresh from Chennai Mathematical Institute. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me. Thanks, Jam, for the introduction. So let me start. Uh, so the aim of this talk, the Jam wanted me to emphasize the fact that uh, uh, there is much reasoning in uh, uh, security protocols. Okay. So this is the focus will be on the kinds of reasoning that you need to do in uh, security protocols, uh, fairly abstract reasoning. I apologize for the lack of pictures or anything. It's text heavy, the slides, but uh, uh, there are not too many. So hopefully, we'll get through this. Okay. So as Jam mentioned, this is a take on this paper called Programming Satan's Computer uh, by Anderson and Needham. Uh, it was one of the early papers that uh, uh, 
tried to educate people on the fact that uh, it's even after your cryptographic uh, schemes are built, you still have more work to do when you uh, program uh, protocols over the network. Okay, so uh, this paper is about showing various kinds of logical flaws that can happen when you design protocols and how you can get around them. Okay. Yeah. So, in fact, <laughs> uh, this is one of the quotes that's by another pioneer, Roger Needham, who uh, <laughs> who emphasized this line of research. Okay. Uh, so let's just look at an example to show what we mean by logical errors. Okay. So here is a protocol. Uh, some uh, this notation just means that uh, n is encrypted with the public key of b. A sends to b some random nonce, some random number encrypted with the public key of b, and b replies to a the same thing uh, encrypted with the public key of a. Okay. So now, uh, how is it possible that b can uh, reply with this message? That's because b has the corresponding secret key. If it gets the encryption, then it can decrypt it and then uh, encrypt it again using A's public key. Okay, so this is the thing. But the point to note is that this is just a, you know, this is the way protocols are uh, presented, but uh, they hide a lot of detail. Okay, and uh, one way in which uh, this uh, thing manifests is in this particular attack. Okay. And uh, to understand this attack, we need to, uh, let me go back to this earlier slide. So the protocol is specified as a message from A to B, but that is not a, uh, ah, okay. But that's not a, but that's not a single act, okay. So there is a gap between the sending and the receipt. And this is really the heart of all, uh, that's really why we need encryption even. And uh, between the send and the receive, the message travels over an insecure network. Okay. So uh, formally, you need to view it as two different uh, roles. Okay. One is the A role, and the other is the B role. A role consists of sending to B from B. And the B role consists in first receiving from A and then sending to A. Okay. And once you split it like this, you can see that uh, there is a large gap between the send and the receive, because here is a scenario that could happen. A sends to B some uh, some P, let us say P is some. Uh, so the, the point is, this is the specification of the protocol. Okay, but in actual, when you run the protocol, uh, you know instead of this, this this n is a symbolic name. Okay? Any value can be sent in place of uh, in place of n. This A and B are also symbolic names. Okay, A stands for any agent. B stands for any other agent who is on the network. So uh, in this attack, A sends to B uh, some P encrypted with B's public key. But what B receives is not from A, the send address. The B receives something, but the sender address is changed. And uh, this is the intruder, I. Okay, and B's protocol is whoever you receive it from, reply to them. So B sends. Uh, B therefore replies to the intruder, and it also encrypts in the intruder's public key. Okay, so therefore the intruder is able to get P, which was supposed to be uh, something that is transferred between A and B. Okay, so this is the attack, and this illustrates the fact that uh, you know between the send and the receive, there is this insecure network. Uh, who can? Uh, this is a reasonably simple attack, but you can have attacks where you know A sends to B first. Maybe there are five parties involved, and uh, the intruder can come in at any stage, can reorder messages, can uh, you know initiate some sessions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so uh, right. So the point here is that the protocol specification mentions uh, abstract names and roles, but the actual executions of the protocol you get by you know instantiating the roles. To many sessions, as we call them. Okay, so the original role had n, which was an abstract name. The session had some concrete p. Okay, and interleaving these sessions arbitrarily, because if you go back to this, it is okay, this is of course the intended behavior. But it could happen that if there are three messages, it could happen that uh, the it is not following the exact same temporal pattern as expected in the protocol specification. Okay. And uh, all this happens in the presence of an intruder who can manipulate messages, but uh, the manipulation of messages is subject 
certain constraints and those we call admissibility conditions. So let us uh, let's see what the intruder is capable of. In general, the intruder can learn all messages traveling over the network, construct new messages and play them back, can send messages under an assumed identity, but the intruder cannot produce messages out of thin air. Okay? So uh, for instance, if I send out n encrypted in uh, jams, uh, public key, let us say, then the intruder cannot just uh, figure out n, right? So the intruder needs to have jams secret key. So that is the point, okay? So uh, this is this is where the reasoning part of this whole enterprise comes in that uh, uh, you need to check whether the intruder can construct the messages that it sends at a particular point in the execution given her current knowledge, okay? And uh, you look at problems like uh, secrecy, etc. Okay, so you need to check for security properties. One of the uh, fundamental security properties is secrecy. That you want to check if a secret has been leaked intruder by some run of the protocol. Okay, this is, a, this is one of the most fundamental properties. Uh, so this this is just setting the scene. Uh, in this uh, uh, here, what I'll do is I'll uh, look at various forms of reasoning that can happen here and uh, various kinds of properties that people are interested in, okay? As Jam mentioned and as uh, various people mentioned, you first need to be able to specify what you are trying to verify, okay? So I'll, uh, so this talk will mostly be concentrated on that and uh, there are lots of results on the verification of these. I'll just mention a few. There won't be any proofs or any such thing. So let's uh, proceed. Yeah, so in general, this whole, uh, thing is uh, under the rubric of what you might call the Dolevyov model. So this was introduced first by Dolev and Yao in 1983. And uh, basically you want to take an abstract view of uh, protocols as well as cryptographic messages. You view them as just some terms from an algebra like this. Okay? So uh, this is a very simple version of uh, uh, the Dolevyov algebra. You can have uh, some atomic messages and then you can have pairing of messages and then you can have encryptions, okay? And uh, the next thing you need to do is to, uh, you need to have rules which specify how you can get new messages from old, okay? Uh, and then you need to have a runtime model and you need to, uh, you know, uh, have a framework for how to, uh, what are the properties that you want to check for and methods for searching for logical flaws. So here is a simple system of rules. You might say that, okay, so if if this T belongs to the my current pool of terms, then I can derive T. If uh, T0, T1, if the pair T0, T1 belongs to my, uh, if I can derive the pair T0, T1, then I can also derive each component of the pair. If I can derive T0 as well as T1, then I can derive the pair. Here, this says that if I can derive T encrypted with K, and if I can derive the inverse of K, then I can derive T. So note that this is uh, this is a real abstraction. Okay, you are not talking about uh, breaking uh, cryptographic schemes or whatever. You are just assuming that the only way you can get a term from an encrypted term is if you know the inverse key. Okay, and uh, so basically you are assuming that uh, your underlying cryptography is correct, but you want to see if you can still uh, you know, uh, derive things not intended to be derived. Okay, and this is the rule for encryption. If you have a term and the corresponding key, you can encrypt it. Okay, and uh, now you can have, you know, for instance, you can have, uh, you know, the, the the important problem that you need to check is given a set of terms x and a particular term t. You want to check whether x can derive t. Here is a simple example. You have m encrypted with k1, k1 encrypted with k2 k2 encrypted with k3 and then k3 also, okay? So then from this, of course, it's clear that you can derive m because you can use this k3 to decrypt this. Uh, I'm assuming that uh, all these, this is shared key encryption and uh, each k3 is its own inverse, k2 is its own inverse, etc. okay? So you use this k3 to decrypt this, you use that k2 to decrypt this and you obtain k1 and you use that to decrypt this and you finally get Okay? This is the kind of things that you want to do. This was just to show you a particular proof, but proofs can get much more complex. And uh, you need to have algorithms to decide whether, you know, x can derive t. Uh, in the case of this simple system, and okay, so this is what is called a passive intruder problem. 
because you can imagine that the intruder is not doing anything at all, just sitting there and observing messages traveling over the network. And uh, anytime a message is communicated over the network, it will uh, store it in its database, let us say. And from time to time, it wants to check if it can derive further messages. Okay, so that's why it's a passive intruder. Whereas an active intruder would actually, in, uh, you know, do stuff like send messages to others, initiate new sessions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so. And as you can imagine, the active intruder problem is much more complex than the passive intruder problem. Uh, so you need to really check if the intruder can orchestrate an interleaving of sessions, which leads to a particular knowledge state from which uh, some secret that you're interested in can be derived. Okay. Fine. So, uh, so there are formal results that confirm your intuition that uh, <laughs> the passive intruder problem, uh, no, <laughs> this is not really intuitive. <laughs> you need to know some. Uh, you need to know some basics of proof theory to realize that uh, you can solve the passive intruder problem in p time. But, uh, and this is also not very intuitive. So you would imagine that the active intruder problem is much more complex than the passive intruder problem. That's fine. But it actually turns out to be undecidable. Okay? This checking whether there is a run that leads to a uh, leaking of a secret. Okay? And this arises from, you know, the uh, kind of innocent looking protocol specifications that you saw at the beginning, okay? Because they pack a lot of information, okay? So, yeah, so in general, this is undecidable and it's solvable in co-NP if you bound the number of sessions. So under various assumptions, you can get better uh, upper bounds, okay? So this is just a quick overview of what this whole thing is about, okay? Why it's a complex problem and uh, Basically, various, uh, so you want to derive methods to address this problem under various assumptions, and you want to translate them into tools. Okay? So this is really the thing. Uh, and we've looked at a very simple uh, system with just pairing and encryption, but you might want to uh, you know, capture lots more primitive. So the, the point is to abstract, uh, to do an abstract study of security protocols, but uh, you should be able to capture enough of the real world complexity. You have lots of encryption schemes, you know, you might have Diffie-Hellman encryption, you can have some exclusive ORs, you can use homomorphic encryption, you can have blind signatures, etc., etc. okay? So then you still want to uh, uh, address those things. So the way to do it is to uh, enhance the proof rules, okay? So the lots of results on uh, these various uh, extensions, okay? Let's look at one example. For instance, if you have XOR, then you would need to add an extra rule, which says that when a bunch of terms, you can, uh, after XORing them also, you have, I mean, you can derive the XOR of them. But here, you need to introduce uh, some extra stuff. This down arrow here means a normal form, which means that if you have X plus Y, X, X XOR with A, XOR with B, and B, then if you XOR these two, you will get A. Okay, so that is the normal form. So you need to do things like this. Uh, this leads to more intricate derivations. Let me not get into the details, but uh, you need to work harder to uh, solve the basic problem, the passive intruder problem, but you can actually do the work and show that it is still p-time, and uh, the active intruder problem, the bounds uh, are more or less the same as in the simple case, okay? Here is another example. You might want to do something called blind signatures. These are uh, situations where uh, um, you know I am able to sign a, so you send me a kind of a sealed envelope and I sign on top of the envelope and the signature sort of seeps through okay so I do not know what the message is but I'm message okay and later so uh, so jam sends me an envelope with a message I cannot open the envelope but I sign it and then uh, uh, he can later open the envelope and show someone else that message with my sign so it's not clear what use sign is still. <laughs> okay, so there are ways to handle this. Uh, I think in, in the interest of time, I should not uh, go through this, but uh, you know, so this leads to more complex kind of reasoning that you need to do. I'll just mention that if you formalize this, then this, you know, you can see that the complexity really jumps and uh, you know, leads to interesting mathematical <laughs> questions, uh, but uh, yeah, so I'll just leave it at that. I'll next get to, so this is probably, uh, uh, 
the most important slide perhaps because we are now saying till now we have seen about uh, reasoning and uh, reasoning involved deriving new terms from old okay but let's uh, look at the following thing so what is secrecy okay so there are till now secrecy means deriving a term okay but is that all just it okay that's the question that i want to ask now so consider two scenarios one scenario where a communicates some n m encrypted with k to b okay and uh, this m is some random number okay in the in the uh, in the trade they call it a nonce okay <laughs> so <laughs> so m is a fresh nonce and the inverse of key is not known to the intruder okay that's fine so now question is is m secret from what we have seen till now uh, do you think m is secret that's what you, uh, even if it's not pk even if it's a shared key with the, the other person uh, right so in the dolave abstraction you cannot derive m unless you know the inverse of key uh, inverse of k and since the intruder does not know the inverse of k it cannot derive m but here is another question so a communicates to encrypted with k to b okay and again the inverse of k is not known to the intruder now the question is is two secret okay and <laughs> does it even make sense to ask this question what is the difference between m and 2 okay m is a random number some well known quantity it's a, it's a in the trade again it's called it's a public name as you might say it's a public value okay for instance this 2 might be so in any protocol there will be some values that are you know for instance if it's voting protocol then there are certain things that you, you, the names of the candidates are all public okay so that's not a secret thing so suppose i suppose my vote is to encrypt the name of the candidate with uh, some key okay and then send then i cannot ask whether you know the name of the candidate is secret okay but but still so it looks like it does not even make sense to ask any question about this two encrypted with k right because two is anyway already known okay but there is still some sense in which you might want to check whether this is a secret message or not right because it is not that you know the thing inside it but it is <laughs> so think of this as an envelope okay uh, of course everybody knows what two means but you don't know you do not know that it is two that is inside the envelope okay so that is the thing that you want to do okay so this is the next level of this is the next level of reasoning that we want to do okay so the point is derivability is not enough to model this because of course two is derivable it's a public name but uh, uh you you need what are called tests okay and let me yeah so here so suppose x is a reference to to encrypt with k so x is some name you used to refer to to encrypt with k then uh suppose inverse of k is not known to the intruder uh, inverse of k is not known to not known to the intruder suppose k is known to the intruder then one can check some in some sense what is inside by checking whether x equals encrypt of 2 and k right because 2 is a public name k is also known to the intruder and then it can do all kinds of it has lots of terms with it it can do all kinds of operations with the terms that it has got and it can check whether it is equal to uh, what it has received here okay which is referred to by x okay that's a test okay so you apply you have a bunch of terms with you you apply all kinds of cryptographic operations on the terms that you have and then you uh, test whether it is actually equal to something else that you have okay yeah uh if k is not known there is that you can do that will uh, uh, that will succeed okay so uh, this kind of test this kind of uh, uh, notion of secrecy is useful when the term inside the encryption comes from a finite fixed set okay it could be voting for instance so there are a, there is a finite list of quant candidates and you uh, build a, a term involving that but uh, you know of course it's not secret in the earlier sense but you need to yeah so you need to do it using these tests okay and uh, this also models what are called dictionary attacks which is a uh, so where you you have a finite pool of things and you use that and encrypt it or do whatever some operations on it and check whether uh, you know some supposedly secret thing equals that okay fine 
So this leads to the next kind of modeling thing, which are called frames. Okay, and uh, yeah, so uh, frames are nothing more than just knowledge states that we had earlier. Earlier knowledge states was just a set of terms that you've seen till now. Now it will be now each term will also have a reference. Okay, and uh, you will also have access to public terms like uh, public values like two or all the names of the candidates, etc. Okay. And uh, all this was formalized first, or maybe not formalized first, but the most influential paper in this is by Abadi and Forney in 2001. Okay, and uh, yeah, so so interesting people, should, people who are interested in it should look at it. It's a it's a nice paper uh, with lots of nice uh, philosophical <laughs> uh, comments at the beginning. Okay, uh, right. So we have tests and. Uh, once you have these frames, you can now talk about two frames being equivalent or not. Okay, and uh, I'll tell you why this is useful in a minute. Uh, so, given so equivalence is based on asking whether two frames satisfy the same tests or not. For instance, you have one frame where x points to asymmetric encryption of zero with public key of k, y points to public key of k. Okay, and uh, f2 is the same thing except the thing inside the encryption is one. Okay. Now the question is: Do f1 and f2 pass the same tests? Okay. Do they pass the same tests? <laughs> so I claim not. There is at least one test which uh, f1 passes, but f2 does not pass. So uh, f1. So the intruder has access to all all kinds of constants, right? So the intruder can encrypt zero with y, with whatever y points to, and check whether it is equal to x. Okay. And that passes in f1, it does not pass in f2. But suppose instead of uh, this thing being uh, deterministic encryption, suppose f1 and f2, uh, suppose the encryption is randomized. Okay, In randomized encryption, you encrypt using a public key, but uh, you also have a random number. And uh, so you encrypt the same twice using the same, same term encrypted twice using the same public key might give you different values because of the random factor but you can decrypt without the without access to the random number okay and so if these two things are uh, if the encryption here is randomized then the claim is that uh, uh, you know no test can distinguish f1 from f2 okay and uh, this notion is called static equivalence okay you have two frames basically two states of knowledge and you want to check whether what whether whether the two are behave the same with respect to tests, okay. And uh, this is useful in uh, things like voting again, <laughs> okay. So, for instance, you want to say the in uh, in a voting protocol, you might want to talk about vote privacy, okay. And it says that the way a particular voted voted is not revealed to anyone, okay. One way of formalizing it is to say that uh, you know consider two frames, two scenarios basically, one where A votes for zero and B votes for one. Another where A votes for one and B votes for zero, and you want to say that no tests can distinguish between these two frames. Okay, so to the eye of the observer, it is the same, and uh, you can have other properties like receipt freeness, which is another important property in voting. You want to uh, ensure that the voter does not have any uh, receipt, which is, which could be some term or some uh, bunch of terms that were communicated, which can be used to later prove to someone uh, is how she voted. And this again is, uh, you need to make some assumptions, but you can formalize this again using uh, equivalences. Okay? So uh, this is, so we talked about derivability, we talked about testing equivalence. And uh, right, so then there is another branch of work, one which uh, we have been involved in, uh, Jam, myself, Vaishnavi, okay? it was her PhD work. Uh, often you might need to communicate not just terms, but also assertions. Okay? For instance, uh, a might send uh, to B a term, M encrypted with K, B does not know K, but uh, A wants to reveal partial structure about the encrypted term. Okay? A wants to say, oh, this is either A or B. Uh, and this is useful in, again, in voting, because you typically what happens is that you send your vote to an authority who shouldn't look at the vote, but who should uh, verify the identity of the voter, and then it will go to another authority who does not know the identity of the voter, but who knows the vote. But the first authority who checks the voter identity and uh, signs the vote using some blind signature or whatever, 
might need an assurance that it's a correct vote and that you are not voting random person okay so you might want to make assertions like this these are sent as assurances to the authority and uh, typically these things are implemented in cryptography by uh, means of uh, non interactive zero knowledge proofs okay so right so this is uh, this is all work that we were involved in uh, no i'm not pointing at you <laughs> yeah so you might and there is non trivial reasoning involved here for instance in the same voting scenario one uh, yes so i have uh, one assertion of the form m equal to a or m equal to b and i have another assertion of the form m equal to a or m equal to c i need to be able to infer that m equal to a right because uh, you know this is eliminating disjunctions okay uh, so you need to ensure that uh, accidentally people don't uh, you know uh, send out these assertions which hide information partially reveal partial information but combining these things together you uh, uh, learn more than what you are supposed to okay and uh, yeah so much of the work we did was formalizing the rules of inference in this case etc the last slide uh, so it is not always that you will send uh, m equals a or m equals b but in the context of a protocol you need to send it in this manner so this v encrypted with k is the actual term that contains the word okay and you will usually have to say you know something about so just to tell you that even more non trivial reasoning is involved you need to include quantifiers etc okay so you want to say the structure of this term is that it's an encrypted term and the thing inside the encryption is either a or b okay that's what you want to say okay and you might want to say for instance that uh, there are two terms uh, x and x prime are two terms and you want to say that there is y prime such that x equals y encrypted with k and x prime equals y prime encrypted with k just saying that the two terms are encrypted using the same key okay so yeah i'm not going into details here but i hope i've given you a flavor of uh, whatever uh, is involved here and uh, there's a lot of tool support for many of these things that you have seen uh, logic programming based this is a theorem prover that's a model checker etc etc okay so i think uh, i'll stop with this